Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. It's Friday, December the 4th, right? Is it December the 4th? December the 3rd, 2020. I lose track, really, during these days of the shutdown. It's a big Friday for me. I am ringing the bell with the Salvation Army. In, uh, i got to go over to Old Town Alexandria today to ring the bell with Commander Ken Hodder, as I do uh, because I love the work. Uh, I think they are an amazing group of people, and I encourage you as you walk past a red kettle to throw something in. I've also got to go to the Heritage Foundation today. They're welcoming their new president. There's a lot going on inside the Beltway in December, and I'm glad to be here. And I will be maskless, even though Omicron is now in 23 states, in 23 countries and four states in the United States. It's California and the three other states. It will be everywhere soon. It's a race. Delta is fast. It appears that Omicron is faster transmits more easily. What we don't know is if it's deadlier than Delta and whether or not the vaccine in the booster works. We don't know that. But your best bet, even not knowing that, is to get a vaccine and get a booster and do it today. Uh, you can't do all three at once, right? You're not allowed to do that. You have to take a vaccine. I mean, Jane Jane taking one dose and then a week uh, later, or maybe it's, I don't know what the Jane Jane is. I don't know how that works. Uh, Pfizer is two doses. Uh, three weeks apart, followed by a booster after six months. And I think that's Moderna. Ask your pharmacist. They will give you a card. You'll be safe for the holidays, I hope. I'll keep you posted on Monday what we know. By Monday, I think we'll know a lot more about Omicron and how deadly it is. President Biden went to the NIH yesterday, the National Institutes of Health, to give a speech. It's important that you hear the president, even though some of it's not so great. Cut number two of the president yesterday. Since this summer... We've worked with Republican and Democratic governors, as many Republican governors as Democratic governors, to deploy what we call surge response teams. These teams work. They provide needed staff for staff overruns, uh, uh, the, the badly needed staff, where overrun hospitals are handling more patients than they can, they, they can handle, for their emergency rooms and intensive care units who don't have the personnel available. They help provide life-saving treatments in communities in need, like monoclonal uh, uh, and antibody treatments. We have over 20 teams deployed now. Today I'm announcing that we're going to triple that, more than double it. We're going to get to 60 teams ready to deploy in states to experience a surge in cases over the course of this winter. I was just with a governor in Minnesota who was raving about the positive impact it's had on his state. But there's other states the same, in the same circumstance. Additionally, we're increasing the availability of new medications recommended by real doctors, not conspiracy theorists, okay? For example, monoclonal antibody treatments have been shown to reduce the risk of hospitalization by up to 70 percent. And uh, for unvaccinated people at risk of developing severe disease. We've already distributed over three million courses of this treatment to save lives and reduce the strain on hospitals. And we're, we're, we, we have promising new arrival. See, he rushed through this. He ought to have paused. Monoclonal antibodies are very important therapeutics for people who are infected. And I don't think he's ever mentioned them before. And I'm glad that he did, even though he rushed through it. That's the part I don't like. Uh, I mean, he's, he's tumbling on his words, but he had a speech impediment. We understand that. But monoclonal antibodies, finally out there in the open, that's good. Here's what he had to say about um, what schools are going to happen when they get a positive test. Cut number three. When we get to that, around that point, vaccinating our children is also critical to keeping our schools open. But while over 99% of our schools are open now, we need to make sure that we keep that throughout the winter, this winter. The CDC is now reviewing pioneering approaches like, as we call, test to stay, test to stay policies, which could allow students to stay in a classroom and be tested frequently when a positive case in that classroom popped up that wasn't them. Up to now, you get go home when you quarantine. But rather than being sent home in quarantine, they'd be able to stay. Be, because the test will be available and regularly. The CDC will be releasing the latest science and other findings in the coming weeks so that... Let me explain this. Let me translate can this learn for you. From an uh, right from now, the pandemic. nightmare policy the Biden administration until yesterday had been, and had been recommended to schools and they've been using it. If a child is exposed to 
HIV, uh, HIV, gosh, no, to COVID, then they have to stay home for 14 days from the last exposure. So imagine a family, oh, for example, my grandkids, where the youngest one gets it, the two-year-old gets it, and the, and the two-year-old did get it, Genghis Kate, 14 days for both of the siblings. And then the second one gets it on day 13. That means another 14 days for the third one. That's how it has been working. That's why it's, a, it's just a nuts. It's nuts. You can't get a kid out of school for 14 days, much less 28 days. And if you have bigger families, it could go on forever. It's just nuts. Children are not at risk from this disease. They spread it, but they don't get sick. Send home the vulnerable teachers. They're going to change that because they realize America moms are just crazy upset with this. And they're ruining kids' years and another year of school is being interrupted. They're going to change that good. Cut number four. This is just a weird aside. They occur. I've seen more <laughs> of Dr. Fauci than I have my wife. We kid each other. But uh, they look, who's president? Fauci. Uh, but all kidding aside, I, I sincerely mean it. I really don't want to make jokes about Dr. Fauci. I know you see him a lot. You don't want to make jokes about him. He is a divisive figure, even if you like him. I got a note from his office. He'll never coming back on this show because I've said plainly he's got to leave. Uh, he's not doing the job anymore, but he's in the job. And once he's in the job, you got to do the job. And part of the job is talking to every audience all the time, including this audience of millions of people, many of whom are vaccine skeptical. And Dr. Fauci won't do the job because he doesn't like hard questions. Honest to goodness. Get out of the kitchen if you can't stand the heat. Um, this part I don't like. Cut number five. I plan to announce, my plan I'm announcing today pulls no punches in the fight against COVID-19. And it's a plan that I think should unite us. I know COVID-19 has been very divisive in this country. It's become a political issue, which is a sad, sad commentary. It shouldn't be, but it has been. Now, as we move into the winter and face the challenges of this new variant, this is a moment we can put the divisiveness behind us, I hope. This is a moment we can do what we haven't been able to do enough of through this whole pandemic. Get the nation to come together, unite the nation in a common purpose to fight this virus, to protect one another, to protect our economic recovery, and to think of it in terms of literally a patriotic responsibility rather than... No! Stop! You You're talking about a divided country. It is not a patriotic responsibility to get vaccinated. It's a smart individual choice. Some people can't get vaccinated. Are they less patriotic because they have fragile medical systems? No. Some people are persuaded by the data that they have seen that this is all overstated. Are they unpatriotic for having access to that data? No. It's not a patriotic issue. It's an issue of individual judgment. And we respect each other as Americans for the choices we make. And I respect everyone out there who has decided not to get vaccinated for whatever reason. Maybe you can't. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you don't have access. Whatever it is. You're a patriot if you love the country. Honestly, the president, I don't, sometimes he just, well, this one was a real head scratcher. Cut number uh, six at the White House yesterday. I was saying to a couple of younger members of my staff before I came over, but the many times I've been to Israel, I said, and then all of a sudden I realized, God, you're getting old, like <laughs> I have known every, every prime minister well since Golda Meir, including Golda Meir. And... <laughs> In the Six-Day War, I had an opportunity to, uh, she invited me to come over because I was going to be the liaison between she and the Egyptians about the Suez and so on and so forth. Uh, no, that didn't happen. Uh, he, he is referring to whatever he did in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Only off by uh, six years, Mr. President. Now that's just being old, but it does illustrate being old. I can't even remember what year the war was in. The 1973 Yom Kippur War, and I can assure you Richard Nixon wasn't going to use a freshman senator from Delaware for anything, for any reason whatsoever. He's just imagining stuff. That's Joe Biden. That, of course, is the sort of music that makes you, absolutely obliges you to think of Sonny Bunch. Sonny Bunch, of course, hosts the Across the Movie Isle podcast and the Bulwark goes to the movie. He's the official film critic of The Hugh Hewitt Show. And he is here. Sonny, let me give you the quick rundown. Ghostbusters Afterlife, five stars from Hugh Hewitt and the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt. Belfast, five stars from the uh, Fetching Mrs. Hewitt and Hugh Hewitt. 
And Kanto, one and a half stars, but the small grandkids liked it. Oh, gosh, that was like razor blades in my thigh. What do you have to say about anything else that's out there? Uh, yeah, in Canto, I haven't seen it. Does not look very good, uh, so I'm I'm probably going to skip it. Which yeah. which is one of the nice things about only having to review a movie or two a week. You can you can skip some of the ones that aren't aren't that great. Uh, you know, it's a weird it's a weird time of year, as you mentioned, as the as the Christmas music su- suggests that it's Christmas time, which means it is uh, award season time. I saw somebody on Twitter joke that it's it's very cruel that they jam all uh, all of the movies that they make for adults in the last six weeks of the year. Yep. Uh, but this is where we are. This is, this is where we are and what we're, what we're dealing with right now. So I'm going to run through a few titles. It's, it's funny. We're in, like I said, we're in kind of a weird time because it's, it's a, there's a weird lull this week where a bunch of the uh, smaller movies are rolling out and platforming. Um, I still haven't seen the new Paul Thomas Anderson movie, Licorice Pizza, because it hasn't opened in Dallas yet, but I, I hear good things. It uh, was named the best movie of the year by the National Board of Review. Um, so if you were, uh, if you're, if you're out in LA or New York, you should check that out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's no, no huge releases this year, um, uh, this week because of, uh, because of award season stuff. Uh, next week we'll get West Side Story of the Steven Spielberg adaptation, uh, of the Sondheim play. And then, uh, the week after that, Spider-Man No Way Home. So things are, things are going to pick up again here in a bit, but let's, let's, uh, let's pick up uh, a movie we didn't talk about last week, uh, because we were, we were off. Uh, House of Gucci, House of Gucci from Ridley Scott. It's Ridley Scott's second movie uh, this year, The Last Duel being the first. I quite like The Last Duel, as, as you might remember. Um, House of Gucci, not nearly as good, not not very good. So it's about uh, a, a woman named Patrizia Reggiani who uh, finds the son of the, the scion of the, the Gucci empire at a party and decides that she's going to marry him because she is oh. uh, kind of a gold digger. Uh, so the, the girl's played by Lady Gaga, the guy's played by Adam Driver. Um, and this movie is full of very good actors who are doing a very, very hammy job. Al Pacino uh, plays Maurizio Gucci, that's Adam Driver's character. Uh, the, uh, Al Pacino plays the uncle, his name is Aldo Gucci. Uh, Jeremy Irons plays uh, Adam Driver's father, uh, Rodolfo Gucci. Jared Leto plays uh, Adam Driver's uh, cousin, Paolo Gucci. Et cetera, et cetera. So there's there's a lot of good actors here. There's a lot of hamming it up. The problem with the movie simply is that it's just not very good. It it is uh, a mess. It is a narrative mess. I can't uh, I can't really describe to you uh, exactly what was at stake in this film from moment to moment. I couldn't I couldn't tell you. Does she you know, get the gold? That, that's the, that's the question, right? Does she get the gold? Well, so yes, don't tell me, but, but that's uh, the question. In the in the so she she marries uh, Maurizio. Oh, she and, gets the gold. Uh, she and okay. Maurizio try to resurrect the Gucci Empire. She's kind of the power behind the throne, you know. The uh, the 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 evil Italian. It's almost a stereotype of like a Roman emperor, right? The evil woman behind the queen, manipulating uh, cousins and nephews and uncles and grandfathers, etc., to get to get what she wants. Um, but the problem again, the problem is. Uh, the movie just goes off the rails. I, I couldn't. It's it's two and a half hours long, and it, oh. feels like it either needs to be it either needs oh. to be ninety minutes and much more streamlined, or like five hours long. And all right, uh, is this a, a, a sexist, sexist question coming up, Sunny Bunch? Sure. Do women like this movie better than men? You would think so. Uh, I, I I don't have the the polling data in front of me, so I couldn't say for sure. But here's here's a, here's another big problem with the movie. Honestly, is that it doesn't really have any interest in the world of fashion, qua fashion. I mean, there there what? are there are a couple of runway shows, uh, and there's there's one very funny sequence where uh, Jared Leto, who plays Paolo Gucci, the kind of idiot uh, nephew of the the Gucci Empire. Is he the Fredo of the Gucci of- Empire, the Fredo character. He's basically the Fredo of the Gucci Empire. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, yeah. He uh, he shows a bunch of drawings of his designs to uh, his his uncle Rodolfo, and and Jeremy Irons just has this wonderful moment where he says, "You can't show these to anyone." And we think, "Well, these he's saying they're so good that he, they can't <laughs> be shown to anyone." But no, he's saying if you show these to anyone, people will laugh Gucci uh, you know out of the world of fashion. People will realize we have we have idiots in the next generation. <laughs> um, but but. 
but but the the I mean that that moment is funny, and I really I actually really like Jared Leto in this. I think he does a very good job as the kind of over the top manic uh, man child that is Paolo. But the whole thing just doesn't work. I can't cannot recommend it. Sadly, not going. Uh, okay, off my list. Anything right, so else that have? I haven't seen? I love Belfast. I just love Belfast. I went with a couple. Of course, I'm a Northern Irish of Northern Irish descent from Saintfield. And I went with another guy of Northern Irish descent who wants to move to Belfast in his retirement. So, yeah, Belfast got me. But then I talked to a, an Irish, uh, 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 an in-law who is Irish of origin, wants nothing to do with Belfast, just too close to home. Have you yeah. seen it yet? I, I, I have seen it. So Belfast uh, is from um, uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh. Uh, it's written in, uh, co-written and directed by Kenneth Branagh, uh, who is a uh, a very good Shakespearean actor and director, uh, who also you know does Hollywood stuff. He made uh, the Murder on the Orient Express film. He directed the first uh, the first Thor movie, etc. Um, it, it is it is as you say. It is a it is a love letter uh, of an expat to Belfast. It's set in the late 1960s during the Troubles, um, but it's told from the perspective of a child. It's told from the perspective of a young boy who is essentially the uh, Branagh figure uh, who, who moves away. Um, and it is, it, is, it is a lovely actor showcase. It is, it is a very nice actor showcase. I really like Jamie Dornan in the film who plays the dad, um, and I really like the mom whose name uh, escapes me at the moment. Um, but also the, the the grandparents in this film, Kieran absolutely Hines, fabulous, uh, and 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 Dame Judi Dench, just wonderful, wonderful uh, actors and actresses. Uh, the the whole thing is 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 quite lovely. Um, it does it does little very showy things, like uh, for instance, when the family is at the movie theater watching the, film, the films, the the screen lights up into color. It's black and white otherwise, uh, which is you know it's it's again this is kind of showy and basic, uh, but it does. Get to the get to the heart of the idea of like the thing that that, that changed Kenneth Branagh's life was the arts. It was seeing you know the arts and performances and all that. Um, I liked it. I certainly liked it. I think it's uh, I think it's an interesting movie. I don't. I the the thing I wish I had the thing I wish had been covered a little more clearly in the film. And it's it's you know it's not a piece of journalism. This isn't the job of the movie. But I, I would have liked it to have gone a little more in depth into. The troubles by keeping it from the perspective of the child, you know, you don't you don't get a very good sense of what the actual stakes were and what everybody wanted. You know, that was the um, objection of my in-law that the the Catholic point of view will not be there, and the Catholic point of view is crucial to be down in Bogland and to and to know about what happened is crucial. The book "Say Nothing" captures both sides very well. That would make a fantastic movie. Sonny, but I am going to have to take half of your airline miles back because we did bet your airline miles on Ghostbusters being the most successful movie of the year, and it is. Well, I, I, uh, I, think, I, had, I think I had misunderstood you. When I was getting off the phone uh, last time, I, I thought you had meant that weekend, and I think I said through Thanksgiving, it's doing well. It is not the most successful movie of the year. It is not, it is not doing as well as a Marvel release. Um, certainly, but I think it's... Oh, really? Uh, oh, then I'll give the airline miles back. I thought it was. No, I yeah, thought I mean, it was it's, ahead. It's, it's grossed about... Uh, well, let's see. Let me pull it up here. It's grossed about $91 million so far, um, which is which is very good, but that's also what Venom grossed in its first weekend. Um, I mean, it, it, it's doing okay. It's doing, it's doing well. I think it'll probably wind up, you know, 10 or 20% ahead of the 2016 Ghostbusters, um, which is good since it had half the budget. I mean, it, it, it's doing... It's doing well, and audiences seem to be very into it. I think it got an A minus from Cinema Score, um, and uh, you know the the second weekend drop off. It's a little hard to judge because it's Thanksgiving weekend, kids are home. You know, uh, it's 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 hard to say exactly. But the second weekend drop off was very good. It only dropped about forty five percent. Okay, put the airline miles back, Adam. That lets me to my last question. I have not seen King Richard, and uh, I know it's streaming. I know it's in theaters. For whatever reason, the idea of watching people play tennis, I don't even watch people play tennis live. <laughs> uh, have you seen it? Do you want, I, I mean, I just, I just can't imagine it being interesting. Well, uh, Hugh, I, I will say this as a former tennis player myself. I was ah. a high school tennis star, you know, one of, the, one of the real leading lights 
of a small town in Virginia that I come from. Uh, I I really enjoyed the tennis scenes in this uh, because it is one of the few times uh, when you're watching tennis in a movie and um, everybody looks like they can actually play. I mean, they got they got kids who could actually play tennis. That was all junior tennis. So I mean, it's you know it is what it is. Uh, but it, it is not. It is not a movie where you're you're going to be spending a lot of time watching tennis. I mean, there's a little bit here and there about tennis strategy and like training the kids to play tennis. Uh, and there is a there is a big it concludes with a big match between Venus Williams and Arancha Sanchez Bacario, one of my favorite names to say in the world of tennis. I'm not going to uh, try that name. Um, but uh, but it's uh, it's it's it is it is what it is is a Will Smith Oscar vehicle. Uh, slash character study. I mean, that is that is what this is. Will it He's work? Playing. Because I, by the way, I think Dame Judi Dench and, and who played Grandpa, um, uh, in, Kieran Hines. Yeah, they're both going to get nominated for best supporting actors. I'm sure they'll I, get nominated. I think that's. A, I think that's that's a that's a very safe bet. I mean, Belfast is an interesting movie because Kenneth Branagh is beloved by Hollywood, um, and it is it is pure uncut Oscar bait. It's the sort of movie I could see getting five or six nominations and not really winning anything. Um, because nobody... Judy nobody Dench is going to win, Sonny. Mm, I'll take that bet. I'll take that bet. All right, bet. we're going to uh, double or nothing on the airline miles I don't owe you. How's that? That sounds good. That sounds anything good. Anything streaming that we need to cover? Because I've covered everything in theaters. I don't I don't think it, Benedetta I've never heard of. Come on, come on, I've never heard of. Doing oh, come the... on, so come on, come on. If you, liked, if you liked Belfast, I think you might like Come On, Come On. It's a very... It's, uh, it is also black and white, uh, and it is also kind of a small... Uh, focused character study on a family uh joaquin phoenix plays an npr journalist named johnny he go he's going city to city to interview kids about the future this is kind of the 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 framing device and the reason to get him moving around the country um but he has to look after his uh his nephew jesse uh because uh, jesse's mom is trying to get jesse's dad into uh, a mental institution to take care of his manic depression now this all sounds like kind of dark but it's actually it's actually a very sweet then I uh, count me in for Come On, Come On, because I've been talking about NPR today with Steve Inskeep, so I'll go see it. Sonny Bunch at Bulwark Goes to the Movie on Twitter at Sonny Bunch and across the movie aisle, a great podcast. Well, it used to be America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Welcome back. If you listen to the show, you know what Churchill used to call the black dog of melancholy has been upon me since my triple loss last weekend. Warren JFK High School football loser, Ohio State loser, Browns loser. I haven't watched a minute of Browns porn or listened to a minute of Browns porn since Sunday night. But Doug Le Maurice, who is co-host of the College Football Survivor Show, along with Shehan J. Rajah, joins me now. Doug, get me out of my gloom. What, what, what are you covering on the College Football Survivor Show podcast? Because I need light in the darkness. We're covering the rise of Michigan, Hugh. Is that a- oh! 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 oh. <laughs> Can Michigan win a national title? Oh, you know what it did against Ohio State! So you know they're going to fold up like a bad chair, Doug. Th- it is interesting, Hugh, that for Michigan to beat Ohio State for the first time since 2011, Michigan just took Ohio State's spot. So if Michigan wins the Big Ten title game this weekend, they should be the number two seed in the playoff, Hugh, and have a decent road to the national title game. And then you might be asking yourself, can this Michigan off- offense go up against Georgia? But it was a double Harbaugh weekend, Hugh. I know. It First, was brutal. Jim beat the Buckeyes and John beat the Browns. It was brutal. How do you react as a professional? You're a professional, but I know you have love of Ohio State and Browns in your heart. And, and you can't really let that come through on the College Football Survivor Show, right? You have to just report the news. I will say, Hugh, I've been covering Ohio State for 17 years. This is the first time I had ever seen a good Ohio State team lose to Michigan. Because oh, the only well, other team I, I covered that lost was 2011, that weird Ohio State year. I will say it was interesting to see something different, right? Because now this rivalry next year will be different. We haven't seen Ohio State come off a loss. How are they going to be? Does Michigan now believe in itself? How are they going to be? So different is always interesting, Hugh, but you got a vibe in Ann Arbor last week. Michigan finally believed. They had the best player on the field in defensive end, Aiden Hutchinson. Yes. Once Michigan scored first, it wasn't a shock to me the way that played out because they got over the belief hump, Hugh, and then they had good players. Now, on College Football Survivor Show, which we usually do the most important game last week we just did, Ohio State-Michigan, this week, it's really Alabama-Georgia, isn't it? 
Georgia is in no matter what, Hugh. They're the, the undefeated number one team. If they lose to Alabama, they will still make it. So Alabama is playing to get in. And, again, Nick Saban has ruled the SEC at Alabama. Georgia wants to dispose of them. Kirby Smart, the Georgia head coach, is the former defensive coordinator at Alabama. He's never beaten Nick Saban. So that is the big game because if two SEC teams get in, then somebody else is getting squeezed out. If Georgia wins and the other favorites win, the four teams in are going to be pretty easy. So Oklahoma State and Cincinnati will be watching that SEC game very carefully because Alabama could bump somebody. Now, Cincinnati cannot get thrown out if they win, do you think? Honestly, Luke Fickle and the boys at the Bearcat land, if they win, they have to be in now. Oklahoma State, I think, is, is behind Cincinnati now, and I think I agree with you, but Oklahoma State is playing a top-10 team in Baylor. I don't think the committee would do it, but I do think Cincinnati would sweat it out a little bit because people have always wondered, how much does the committee really love this underdog team from not a power conference? But I think you're right. I think it would be Oklahoma State as the, the winner of the, the Big 12 if it beats Baylor. Oklahoma State would get bumped by Alabama. All right, now, if Armageddon happens, Alabama loses, Michigan loses, Cincinnati loses, Oklahoma State loses, who goes with Georgia? It's a lot of confusing stuff. I think Notre Dame is then in for sure. Notre Dame has one loss, is not in the conference, is sitting home this weekend, and Notre Dame also doesn't have a permanent head coach that they've officially announced because Brian Kelly left. But Marcus Freeman, the former Ohio State linebacker, the defensive coordinator there is going to be the new head coach. I think Notre Dame would be in, and then I think Baylor beating Oklahoma State would be in, and then I think Iowa beating Michigan would probably be in. We'd have two lost teams in the playoff for the first time if we get the most chaotic of the chaos. Doug, Doug, I know know you're being professional, but Ohio State is better than all those teams except Georgia. It just is. We know that. They're not going to put in a two-loss non-champ, Hugh, especially one that did not even play on conference championship weekend. They have it. They don't have. They have one good win over Michigan State. The other two good teams they played in in Oregon and Michigan, they lost. Baylor and Iowa would have the same number of losses as Ohio State, and would be hoisting a trophy. I, I do not think Ohio State, no matter how good they are. I do not think there's any path for Ohio State to be in. 45 seconds, Doug. In your honest view, who are the four best teams in America? If you had to send them abroad for the Olympics of football, which don't exist, who are the four best teams? Georgia clearly number one. Alabama probably honestly is one of the top four just because they have the most number of talented players. I do honest, I honestly think, uh, Hugh, it might be Michigan and Cincinnati because – Ohio State has a lot of good players. Their defense is suspect, and I think Cincinnati is better than people think. Ohio State might be fifth, though. All right. Now, we have 10 seconds. Do we get a new defensive coordinator at Ohio State? It's going to be somebody that can't come back and do the same thing, Hugh. they got to hire someone on the outside. Doug LaMaurice, you're, you're so sharp on this stuff. The College Football Survivor Show with Doug and Shahan Jaharaja. Do not miss a day of it. I'm coming out of my gloom. I'll be listening to it today. So should you. I'll be back. Hour two of the Hugh Hewitt Show ahead. Now by the poet laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show, Tarzana Joe. Hello, Joe. Hello, Hugh. You know, it's been the first year of my adult life that a November has passed, and I didn't watch a program about JFK. In fact, I didn't even see one advertised. Wow. And it struck me that when you topple some history, you risk losing it all. And because there's another important date that will pass before we speak again, I wrote this. Sundays start with services all across the nation, thanking God and praying for the beauty of creation, the vastness of the ocean, the blueness of the sky, the innocence of children every time they ask us why. Every day we labor, life can put us to the test, working for our daily bread, but Sundays are for rest. Except one Sunday morning, and at what a horrid cost. The vastness and the blueness and the innocence were lost. Eighty years of Sundays. Can you feel them passing by? And all of us, like children, continue asking why. 
Those lost to us are speaking. Can you hear the things they sing? They want us to remember them. They want us to keep praying. Sundays start with services, practical and prayerful. Remembering their lesson, you can never be too careful. The greatest heroism that our country's ever known. May we honor all their services with service of our own. That's 80 Years of Sunday, December 7th, by Tarzetta Joe. Thank you for that, Joe. Uh, my mother-in-law was on the island that day. My sister-in-law and brother-in-law, well, my brother-in-law wasn't born yet, but eventually they would lose their father to the Pacific War. And you're right. It's been 80 years since Pearl Harbor. I hadn't thought about that until I heard you read that. Uh, well, uh, my son brought it to my attention. He is uh, serving as a, uh, well, on Saturdays, he's a barnacle scraper on the USS Iowa Military uh, Navy Museum in San Pedro, ah. and then on Sundays, a docent there. So um, uh, he said, you know, Dad, you should write a poem about 80 years. Bravo to Tarzana Joey. And bravo to all the families touched then and now by Pearl Harbor. Thank you, Joe. Uh, busy season, Christmas season for poetry. Tarzana Joe at ringing dot com. Uh, yes, uh, I'm wrapping up the uh, annual uh, take of, uh, of poetry, poetic clients. But uh, yeah, bring them on, bring them on, bring them on. If you need a if you need a Christmas party poem, Joe will work on an urgent basis. Emergency. It's like the ambulance pull up. The poetry ambulance pulls up, and Joe runs out in his white coat. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. If you want an email, if you want that poem about Pearl Harbor 80 years hence, head over to TarzanaJoe.com. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, you. Back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. As you know, uh, the last hour of each Hugh Hewitt show on Friday is the Hillsdale Dialogue, but I dragged Dr. Arn, president of Hillsdale College, in early because we're talking about Shakespeare next hour, but I want to talk to him about abortion this hour, and that's just too great of a juxtaposition of awful and grand in the uh, same hour that we're going to separate it by a segment. There was Dr. Arn. Good. Good morning. Good day. Good morning. There was a enormously important, maybe the most important Supreme Court argument of my majority, meaning since I turned 18, was Wednesday at the Supreme Court in the case of Dobbs. Have you followed it? Well, I followed it. I didn't. I haven't read the argument, uh, but yeah, I've followed it. Now, I believe six justices are going to throw up their hands and say, we're done. Roe and Casey do not work. And Justice Sotomayor almost threw a fit on the bench because I think she thinks what I think. And what do you think will happen if they do that? Well, I, uh, you know, first of all, Roe v. Wade is one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in history from many points of view. Yes. Be- because... What does it try to do? It tries to opine or establish a national rule about a controversial thing based on arguments about science. You know, when is it a, when is it a, 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 a baby? When is it a human, right? How many weeks and all that stuff? Viability, yeah, viability. And that's just legislation, right? And so we have to get rid of that thing. I hope that they will find a way not to impose something that's just like that, right? I mean, in the end, what I think is there should be some latitude in the states about that. Well, that's Uh, what uh, Judge Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, was such a happy surprise because at, at a couple of points he came in and spoke at length about, A, what precedent means and what it doesn't mean, and B... Why are we trying to do this? This is for legislatures and right. for states. And that Mississippi and Alabama will be different from New York and California. And that's okay. That's the his key thing was, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. The, uh, your friend of mine, Christopher Cox, uh, retired now lawyer in Southern California. And he was a great congressman. And he used to say, and you know, he's as pro-life as you and me. Right. Yes. But he, he used to say in the structure of American law, there, there's a way it works. And some people think that abortion is murder and some people think it's cosmetic surgery. And both of those things are within the power of the states. And it's been nothing but trouble since they did that. And and, you know, it'll it, and so I hope they find a way to do it so that there can be a debate among a free people in various places, 
how much of it to have. And, you know, I would have none of it. But, you know, for sure, for sure, this eighth and ninth month abortion, that's just, and, you know, killing them sometimes after they're born, that is horrific. It's barbaric. And, it's just and, barbaric. And, you know, and the Supreme Court of the United States has authorized, authorized that. No, no, I, I want to be careful. They have, once they authorized it, and then it was struck down, once we yeah, got one of the good right. ones on. Let, let, you know what was great yesterday? Justice Thomas, who I know you are friendly with, he asked the poor counsel for the Center for Reproductive Rights, the uh, uh, favoring abortion on demand. Now, where is this right to abortion? I'm paraphrasing. Where is it? And she gave the standard answer of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and if you piece together this sentence here and that interest there, and he said, but we're talking about abortion, and it's not there, right? And she's had to say, look, we're a little bit here and we're a little bit there. That's what it comes back to. The framers said nothing about this. And Brett Kavanaugh said, a lot of people are urging us to be rigorously neutral. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. And see, we, we, the American Republic is not formed so that these guys get to say, what the Constitution says, except on the subjects that it covers, and, and except on the cases that come before it, right? And so, so we're acting we're acting like they're God, and we got to stop that. And the justices I like, and you know there are some, and I think Clarence Thomas is the greatest modern judge, the greatest of them all, and and he doesn't think that they're a Solomonic council. And these decisions in abortion, they give cover, right, to a lot of these crazy things. Because, you know, in, uh, our, our, in some states, our abortion laws are the most liberal, by which I mean callous, in the world. And y- y- you've got to stop doing that, right? Did, did you, uh, anyone point out to you what the chief justice said at one point? The chief justice said to the council for... Uh, abortion rights activists, you realize, of course, that we shouldn't take our cues from international law. But if we did take our cues from international law, we're right up there with the People's Republic of China and North Korea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she could. She said, although that's not true, and, and, you know, everybody knows that's true. She tried to invent a different line for the other civilized nations of the world as opposed to the barbarian totalitarian regimes. And she can't because we are. Yeah. It's just... It's, it's, you know, it's, it's awkward. But one, one of the reasons the American government is so awkward, we've been talking about Shakespeare, right? And yeah, or we will be. It was awkward. It had a bad form of government. We used to have a good form of government, but that requires that the three branches each stay in their lanes, and they're all out of their lanes now. And, and I think we're going back, though. I mean, yeah. I really think after I heard that argument, I was wrapped. To, you know, yeah. they, they, they tell you, you can go listen to it if you want, you want to look it up. And I just kept tweeting out things. Wow, amazing. Hooray, mm-hmm. bravo for Alito, who said, was Plessy v. Ferguson wrong the day after it was decided, or did we have to wait 50 years to decide it was wrong? Because the obvious evil of it in Korematsu and Dred Scott are that they are obviously evil. And yeah. Roe is just obviously bad. And the fact that they got it wrong a second time, they tried to land the plane the second time in Casey, you know, 20 years later, yeah. doesn't make it any bit better. It's wrong, too. It's two plane crashes. Yeah, I, I'm okay. actually, I'm kind of excited about this, but this is what I wanted to get your opinion of. Yeah. You're up there in that liberal state with that, that governor who ought to have stopped all those renegade Michiganders from running onto the field because they weren't socially distant after the unfair game that got Ohio State sent home from the playoffs. They, Justice Sotomayor sort of threw kind of a tantrum. She talked about this will leave a stench, and they'll think we're politicians if we reverse these cases. I mean, it was an extended three-minute um, soliloquy on how awful uh, she knows what's coming. Where uh, Roe, in case you're doing, yeah. what do you think the re- the response of the American people will be? Well, I I hope. I mean, first of all, the the, the way America is disposed today is that there's a class of person uh, who are very excited about anything like this, right? Most people on a daily basis know. And, uh, and so I hope for calmness, and I hope that they return, 
you know, what I, you know, God, what would I do, right? I'm not, I don't know what to do because I'm not, I don't have the responsibility, so I haven't figured it out. But I, I think this, I think we ought not to be killing eight-month-old babies. I think that's just terrible. And, and, you know, when do you not do it? So I would like to see some rule about that, or at least what I'd really like to see most of all is the latitude of the states to ban that, which is where the, the power rightfully belongs. I, I think what I would like to see in the language of constitutional law is the court to, to say, Roe and Casey are finished, we're out of this, and we will review any state law only on the basis of rational basis review, which is extremely deferential to the states. Yeah, that would go. allow them the opportunity to strike down late-term abortion-permitting laws and would give them the opportunity to strike, uh, to uphold laws by a state that, for example, permit the morning-after pill, with which I have disagreements, but which is, is, I think, beyond the ken of the Supreme Court to strike down if the state of California wants it. It's been authorized by the FDA, and that is an appropriate use of their interstate commerce power. So I... I actually want them to get out of the business of this, except in extreme cases. Okay, I, I want to I want to announce two things to the audience. And one is you just said that better than I did. <laughs> and and the, write that down. But wait, that liberates me to say that I'm a better man than you because I've not been making fun of Ohio after that ball game the other day. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, which <laughs> the Browns lost on Sunday night too. So it's been, and my high school lost on Friday night. So on Friday night, my high school, John F. Kennedy, Warren Eagles lost a semifinal in the state. On Saturday, Ohio State lost in the Big House in Michigan. On Sunday, the Browns lost in Baltimore. It was a long weekend, Doctor. On December, had to be better. You know, you're, you're going to get so downcast, you're going to become a Steelers fan. That is not going to happen. I do. I will not turn to the dark side. We're, we've got Richard II coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to go all Richard II on you. <laughs> Talk to you in about 20 minutes, Dr. Larry. And get your better partner back, Dr. Stephen Smith. Bring him along, and thank you for sticking around, coming early in to, to talk with me about that. Okay, good. Thank be you. Be well. Bye-bye. He'll be right back. Uh, we're going to do the whole hour on uh, Shakespeare with Dean Stephen Smith. His better half. <laughs> Dr. Arn got a jab in there. I hope you're still listening as you wait. Uh, come back. The Hilltail Dialogue. We're going to do all the history plays. All of them. Uh, with uh, Larry and Dean Stephen Smith, professor of English at Hillsdale. All things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Uh, let, <laughs> he, he, he tore me. Uh, he put, it's like the end of Gladiator when Russell Crowe is standing there and the emperor comes up and says, let me talk to you, Russell, and puts the knife right in. That's what he did just there. I'm bleeding out as we speak. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. I'm joined by Charlie Dombeck of Key City Capital. You can find out all about Key City Capital, a great sponsor of this show, this segment at keycitycapital.com. Charlie, uh, you and I were emailing, uh, and the House and the Senate are about to change the tax laws of the United States. I've been telling people all week long, as soon as that happens, they should take a number of years of their past returns, call you up and find out whether or not you're the right kind of client, high-income client and that you've got to look at that. Am I right? They're about to change the tax laws. They're about to change the tax laws. Uh, the tax laws have wavered back and forth between various proposals. There was the wealth tax, there was the family plan, and now there's Build Back America. And we've been fortunate that we've had two reasonable Democratic senators that have essentially allowed us to dodge a major tax bullet, I believe. Um, We've not been able to enact much of the legislation that would have affected many of our listeners. But nonetheless, uh, the Biden administration wants to substantially increase marginal rates. The Build Back America plan has many changes in it. And the reality is I formed my CPA firm two decades ago to help clients recover dollars that they unnecessarily pay in the form of state and federal income taxes. And most CPAs are simply historians, and we do a very good job of helping clients mitigate that cost and doing simply what other CPAs don't. Well, that's service number one. And I want people to understand it's a great service if you're a high net worth individual, keycitycapital.com slash Hugh. But now, Charlie, you've got a new fund open, and this is not an offer to sell or a solicitation. I want people to read the fine print, get the uh, prospectus. But people ask me, they've heard you, they like you. What kind of investments do they do and how much do they need? You've got a fund open. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so we have um, our eighth successive fund open, which we started in April of, of last year. It's a real estate investment fund that invests in workforce, passive, rental, single-family, and multifamily homes. We provide homes for middle-income Americans, which is the segment that has the largest demand, which is essentially recession-proof because you always have tenants. In fact, during the COVID pandemic, we were at 96% economic occupancy, which meant we didn't have to evict tenants. We didn't have problems collecting rents. But the way the fund works is it's a $100,000 minimum investment. You invest for a period of five years. And unlike the financial markets, you earn a rate of return from three components. You earn a fixed guaranteed preferred rate of return, which is 8% per annum paid in quarterly installments. And as an investor, you share in direct ownership of the properties in the portfolio. You receive 80% of the operating profits and gains on sale. And right now, because of the focus in two states, Texas and Florida, where we've been investing for over five years, the portfolio is performing north of 25% annually over that five-year period. So if you put in $100,000, what are you making on a year, and when do you get back the $100,000? So you're going to earn immediately from day one your 8% preferred rate of return. That starts the day your money actually gets deposited into the fund. Once a year, you'll also get an allocation of your share of operating profits. And if any properties have been sold within the close of the quarter, those properties are sold, you'll receive your share. At the end of the fund, which is five years, typically between year four and year five, there'll be some sort of capital event, either a refinance or a sale of a major asset in the fund, and all of your capital comes back to you at that point. Even though all of your capital comes back to you at year four or five, if there are still properties in the fund, and there will be, you will continue to receive a share of operating profits and gains on sale until all properties in the fund have have been sold. And what that allows most clients to do is to reinvest at, say, year four or five in the next successive fund and essentially double dip on your rate of return. So we're able, after years four and five, to really accelerate the way our clients grow their wealth. So, Charlie, key question. And again, people need to get the perspectives. They need to sit down and talk with you about this. I'm just curious, why didn't everyone do this who's got $100,000 or more? Why, why don't they want a guaranteed rate of return at 8%? Yeah, tell me it's not guaranteed. I should say it's not guaranteed. The reason... The reason why people don't invest in these funds is they don't have access to these off-market investment opportunities. The financial industry at large is engineered and wired not to have access to these types of investment opportunities because your typical financial advisor can't earn a commission, can't earn a fee, can't charge an asset management fee for 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 providing access to these types of investments. So you can't go to your Morgan Stanley or your Merrill Lynch and have access to these investment opportunities. These are classified as off-market investment opportunities, and you're direct to operator, which means you're getting access to an investment product where there's not multiple layers of fees and charges like there are in the financial industry. So we give clients direct access to rental real estate investment opportunities that are not typically available in the financial industry at large. KeyCityCapital.com slash Hugh. KeyCityCapital.com slash Hugh. Charlie, we'll talk to you about everything. I just, I bring it to your attention. It's going to be a wild year. I think it's a great firm. I think Charlie's a great guy. Thank you, Charlie Dombeck. KeyCityCapital.com slash Hugh. I'm coming right back with Shakespeare for Christmas. Stephen Smith, Dean of the uh, Hillsdale College. Dr. Larry Arn will be back. He's sitting in the green room waiting to return after stabbing me on Ohio State. Don't miss a minute of the Hillsdale Dialogue, the last radio hour of the week straight ahead here on the Hugh Hewitt Show.